Thank you all for coming this afternoon to our presentation. Uh, our panel here is entitled, uh, Why Anthropology Matters, Making Anthropology Relevant and Engaging a Larger Public Audience Through Pedagogy. My name is Audrey Rickey, and I'm the organizer for this particular session, though I worked also with Teresa Winstead, who was not able to be here today. The panel idea came out of a discussion that we had here last year at the AAAs uh, with the Teaching Anthropology Interest Group. And I was really inspired by uh, Kathy Davidson's 2017 Anthropology News article, The Future of Higher Education as well as my own approach to teaching in the classroom, which it takes more of an applied, engaged perspective on pedagogy. And from there, this uh, particular session was born. So as educators, we have the opportunity to work with a large group of individuals, sometimes almost 1,000 students in a given academic year. So today's panelists will be sharing with us some strategies they have developed to bring anthropology to a broader audience and to show why anthropology matters. I would like to invite uh, up our first uh, speaker today is Michael Welsh. And his title of his presentation is Teaching as Ontological Shifting, Living Toward New Ways of Thinking on Anth101.com. Thanks. <coughs> uh, you can bring up my slides and I'll show you a picture of my class here. Uh, so this is a, my class. I teach a really big class at a state university. It's a required class. You can imagine uh, the, the scenario there. And of course, higher education is in a bit of a crisis. And since the crisis, uh, these students that you see here have, been, have come to be known as SCHs, uh, semester credit hours. And what I do is deliver what are called SLOs. And if you've ever ha been in the throes of trying to figure out what a good SLO is, you know that it's quite difficult because there seems to be an inverse correlation between uh, meaningful SLOs and measurable SLOs. Just as an example of this, uh, I can show you, say if you take like a really uh, sophisticated definition of anthropology and what it is that we do, something like John Komaroff's uh, article, The End of Anthropology, and you see that it's, it involves being holistic, critical estrangement, mapping processes by which social realities are realized, attention to context, 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 which is always theoretical, grounded theory, being empathic and reflexive. You'd see that students then should be able to identify multiple dimensions, connections, and causalities, see beneath surfaces and beyond appearances while attempting tra to transcend biases and assumptions, understand how we co-construct the world, see the world big and small, identify, apply, apply, and shift perspectives, sit in the immersive ambiguity and uncertainty of a messy problem for an unknowable length of time while slowly giving birth to a meager little insight, treasure it for a moment, and then throw it away. Imagine their way into another's perspective and embrace it, even if, or especially if, it is contrary to their own, and understand themselves as culturally and temporally bounded entities mired in cultural biases and taken for granted assumptions that they can only attempt to transcend. And of course, the problem is that these are very meaningful, but not very measurable, and we end up somewhere over here in a lot of these really big classes with questions like this. And so, I find this to be a bit of a crisis. It's this SCHs and SLOs ultimately lead to the big crisis, what one I would call a crisis of significance, a crisis of students trying to figure out what's the purpose of this? What are we doing here? What, like these multiple choice exams, what, what, what's the point of this kind of material? So I've been teaching now for 12 years and, and it, I've been mired in this crisis this entire time. And just a few years ago, I, it kind of really hit me and I, I tore out my notebook and I just started rolling through my, my syllabus and realizing uh, kind of what a, what a fraud it was in a way. I realized that typically we teach these 16 topics, which are defined largely by the fact that we have 16 weeks. And I started thinking, <laughs> you know, what I'm really trying to do is teach something like the ethos of anthropology. I really sat down and I thought about what those were. And I came up with these 10 things, which I listed into what I call the 10 lessons of anthropology. And, and now I enter my classroom and I, I, I uh, introduce it like this. Uh, excuse the dramatic music here. Um, people are different. These differences represent the vast range of human potential and possibility. Our beliefs, ideas, ideals, values, even our abilities are largely a product of our culture. We can respond to such differences with hate or ignorance, or we can choose to open up to them 
and ask questions we have never considered before. When we open up to such questions, we put ourselves in touch with our higher nature. It was asking questions, making connections, and trying new things that brought us down from the trees and took us to the moon. It's not easy to see our assumptions. Our most basic assumptions are embedded in the, in the basic elements of our everyday lives, our language, our routines and habits, our technologies. We create our tools, and then our tools create us. Most of what we take as reality is a cultural construction realized through our unseen, unexamined assumptions about what is right, true, or possible. We fail to examine our assumptions not just because they are hard to see, but also because they are safe and comfortable. They allow us to live with the flattering illusion that I am the center of the universe, and what matters are my immediate needs and desires. Our failure to move beyond such a view has led to the tragedy of our times, that we are more connected than ever, yet feel and act more disconnected. Memorizing these ideas is easy. Living them takes a lifetime of practice. Fortunately, the heroes of all time have walked before us. They show us the path. They show us that collectively, we make the world. Understanding how we make the world, how it could be made or understood differently, is the road toward realizing our full human potential and is the road to true freedom. And then of course, we have the challenge of measuring that and thinking about how do you actually measure whether the students master that. And I just want to call your attention here to the challenge of this uh, by calling your attention to this guy here. Uh, he sits in my classes and sleeps through most of them, um, or he's looking at me like this all the time. And after a while, I got really mad, and I decided to approach him about this. And so I walked up to him one day, and I woke him up, and I said, hey, do you want to go to lunch? And so we went to lunch, and I asked him why he slept in my classes. And he said that he had an addiction to games. And then he went on to tell me that it wasn't just a, an addiction to playing games, he actually made games as well. He started describing this game he designed on hexagon cards that uses these mythological figures. I found out that he knew more about mythology than I do, and I teach a class on mythology. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to see him a little differently. And I started to realize that the system that he was inside of had defined him in a certain way that made him disengage and check out. So I invited him to be part of a different type of class, one where there would be no lectures and no textbooks and no grades, a class where he could use his talents and merge them with the talents of others to create something really worthwhile. So over time, he, he found that he could redefine himself in a class like this. And over, he ended up spending uh, many, many nights working on this uh, video game, and I started to see him and these other sleepers a lot differently. And what he'd created actually is uh, this empathy game, you might say, about living with Alzheimer's. This was a small class, and the students did field work throughout the entire semester living in a retirement community, and they took people's real memories and to create this virtual reality game. And what it, that experience taught me was that you can't just think your way into a new way of living. You have to live your way into a new way of thinking. But I wondered, could I do that in a big class? It was easy to do in a small class. Could I do it in something bigger? And so I took these 10 lessons that I just read to you, and I decided we really have to put these into action. And so I created 10 challenges to go along with the lessons. And then we created this um, website. This was created along with my colleague Ryan Klataski at Kansas State. And we decided to just open this up. Everything would be free. We'd connect it. We'd create connected courses around the, around the nation, maybe around the world someday, uh, offer a free textbook. Uh, there's copies here if, you, if you'd like a copy. Uh, it is available at cost on Amazon for $15, but it's free online. And that compares pretty well to the other textbooks on the market right now. Uh, the idea is to create these 10 lessons and then merge it with these 10 challenges. So the first lesson, people are different. The challenge is to go talk to strangers. And we do a lot of this on Instagram. So if you want to just follow the hashtag Anth101, you can see some of the student work there. Uh, you'll see things like this, uh, students going out talking to strangers in a Walmart parking lot and asking questions like, what's your favorite thing about being in love? And they say this and drive off into the sunset. Or this woman. Uh, Leah, who was who's pushing carts, trying to save, uh, trying to stay in shape, so she can donate a kidney to her sister, 
the student found her trying to save the life of a, of a baby bird, um, and then he looked down and saw her tattoo, which says sisters here. Lesson three is about asking, it's about evolution, basically human, uh, w what it is to be human, but asking questions, making connections, trying new things being the core of that. So trying new things becomes the quest, the challenge, and they, they try something new for 28 days to try to learn something new or break a habit, and, the, and there's all kinds of different things people do. They try to do backflips or learn guitar or whatever it might be, and they do make progress, which is kind of fun. Um, and then, of course, we join as well. So this is me trying to learn violin. And that's, this is day four now. And then this is Ryan Klataski, my partner in, with Ant 101. And we start a little band with the students. It's called the 28-Day Band. <laughs> and on the 28th day, we premiere. Lesson eight, we are more connected than ever, yet feel and act more disconnected. For this challenge, students have to take some object that they own and find somebody who actually touched it in a foreign land before it came to them. So students end up Skyping all over the world. This is a Skype call to India where some Victoria's Secret um, uh, clothing was made. The whole point here is to create the world as a classroom. And, and everything, it, it really tears down the walls in so many ways. I find myself even lecturing outdoors sometimes and recording it. And we also send uh, TAs all over the world as well. And so the TAs are actually doing these same challenges, but all over the world. And students can ask them questions about the cultures they're encountering and the people they're encountering in these other places. And so it really just starts to tear down the walls and give a sense of, of, uh, of possibility to the students. And then I also bring my lectures out into the world as well. So I've, I've always you know, lectured about race, but I thought, why not actually take that lecture out into the, the town? And so we did a, a story about racial segregation in, in Kansas City. And it just, it just brings the whole world into the classroom, or at least our community. Uh, over a million people, most of them around Kansas City, saw that video and discussed it. It became a major uh, platform of discussion for the whole community to think about why we're so racially divided. And it's these types of things I think we could all be doing uh, by, by tearing down the walls, so to speak, of what we're talking about. And the main thing, though, is to get out and do these challenges and to show students that it is possible to experience difference and experience differently and experience more, because ultimately, Learning anthropology is really a shift in ontology. It was for me, and I think it probably was for many of you. It's a sense of a new way of being in the world, and that's what I want to translate to the students. So lesson nine, then, is memorizing these ideas is easy. Living them takes a lifetime of practice, and the heroes show us the path. So this was inspired for me by a former student who was an amazing student, a wonderful student, but while he was prepared for class every day with his readings, he wasn't really living life. And in my class, he said the most important thing he ever learned from me was about these heroes that I talked about, that they somehow felt called to adventure, would go on a road of trials, and were transformed. He said there was a young woman in there that was like the heroes I talked about, and she really had been on a road of trials and was transformed and had a lot to teach him, so that when they first met, they instantly fell in love. And I remember this, they, uh, they got together, they rose a ki kid together, and I thought they would live happily ever after until he wrote me a few years later. He says that after that, he just started running. And he was just trying to figure out like, what went wrong. So he'd run all day and all night, 20 miles a day sometimes. He ran through all seasons for month after month. He said he'd often run barefoot just to feel something as he was trying to numb himself to the pains. And then one day he said he just felt like he was lifted outside of his body and he could see himself running through the park. And he said this is what anthropology taught him. It gave him this perspective, this ability to 
see from afar. And he looked down on himself and he had this sense of empathy and compassion for himself that he never felt before. And he said to himself, my goodness, you're a hero. But he wasn't thinking like, I'm a hero and I'm better than everybody else. Instead, he thought he was suddenly running through the park and seeing heroes everywhere. And it just opened up the whole world to him. And he says it was this sense of wisdom and compassion that ultimately healed his relationship. So challenge nine, inspired by him, is to see yourself as a hero. The last two challenges are very ref reflective and reflexive in the students trying to figure out what they really learned from these challenges and how they can carry them forward in their life. So I'll just end with a sense of the plan for this, uh, for the future of this. We'd like to create a hub for free resources for teaching anthropology, guided, <clears throat> guided by two key ideas. One, that anthropology can be and should be for everyone, free, engaging, speak to a diverse public. Two, it, should, it could be such that you have to live your way into a new way of thinking designed around this key idea. We want to connect multiple intro courses taught independently yet collaboratively. We want faculty sharing of great content and challenges. Someday we'd like to provide small grants and funding for anthropologists and students to produce great content, small videos, articles, and so on. Go to Anth 101 if, if you'd like to join our Google group. I also have free copies of a rough draft of this textbook if you're interested. Thanks. I'd like to invite up our next presenter, Willa Zinn. The title of her presentation is Chiefs Need, I'm sorry, Chefs Need Anthropology, Critical Reflections on Teaching at the Culinary Institute of America. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here this afternoon with us. Uh, I know the distractions of this area wait, but we appreciate you being here. And uh, I'd like to start today just by asking you a few questions. Um, and, and first of all, just asking you, oh dear. Sorry, technology never ceases to impress. All right, so my first question for you all is, what were you like at 18? But did you know what you were gonna be when you were growing up? Um, did you have a clear goal? Did you have something in mind, perhaps, that you wanted to be? And just take a moment to think about that and just keep in the back of your head. Um, I'm not going to ask you to respond since this is sort of a, not necessarily the most conducive session for it. But I want you to hold that thought for a moment. Because most of you probably when you're 18 um, had very little idea of what you wanted to be. Or maybe you had some big ideas, right? You wanted to be an astronaut still. Or, and then you realize, you know, social scientists don't generally qualify as a real scientist for the NASA program. Okay. Or maybe you want to become a real doctor and not the type of philosophy like many of us are in this room. So, okay, maybe at one point you want to save lives and not just change them through education. All right. Maybe some of you were interested in law or becoming a lawyer. Um, others perhaps are interested in becoming an engineer, right? Um, and somehow all of us in this room found our way to anthropology. You know, we fell down <laughs> the circles of hell and we ended up at the sixth one here. The six of hell, for those of you who've never read Dante, is heresy, which explains our current situation very well. But anyway, right, for most of us, the way we found our way to anthro is through some happy circumstance, right? Perhaps some of us took a really awesome general ed anthro 101 course like Michael's, right? If, if I had taken that, maybe I, would, I probably would not have been one of the sleepers. Maybe I would have done something interesting. Or maybe you'd watch some really cool film featuring anthropologists and you decided this is it. This is what I want to do when I grow up, right? Maybe something like this. Oops. This guy, right? Maybe you saw him, you thought, decided I want to go hunt treasure and you realize, oh, right, I have to battle with funding agencies and other things. Maybe it's not so straightforward being an archaeologist. Or maybe you took a really interesting vacation somewhere that opened your eyes to a different culture, a different place, a language, um, a different set of habits and rituals. Um, perhaps you did an internship at some type of agency, or there are some other chance discovery that led you to your current place and status. Um, and indeed, that's really common for most of us in anthropology, but also other liberal arts subjects, right? That it was some type of chance discovery for you as a young person that led you to your interest in, in the subject that you end up pursuing as part of your career. 
And so as a result, we see articles um, like those published in higher ed journals um, and magazines, such as the one recently fe featured in the November-December issue of Anthropology News, which was titled, Who Majors in Anthropology and Why? by Daniel Ginsberg. And these types of articles are, are what I call the agonizing articles, right? They're the ones that are trying to uncover and also explain who's coming into our fields um, and also justify why we need to exist. Because honestly, we live in a climate where programs are being cut, funding is being cut, and we have to explain to parents who are footing the bill why you know, our, our students need anthropology or need other liberal arts subjects. Right? And in particular, this recent article, Who Majors Anthropology and Why, um, Daniel Ginsburg highlights the importance of helping students among anthropologists, to, and it's, it's importance of helping students and their parents see the value of anthropology and other liberal arts subjects. And he points out that um, we in anthropology train our students to develop important life skills like critical thinking and writing, intercultural perspective. And authors of these articles always suggest that these skills are important not just for careers, but also for developing a well-rounded life as an engaged global citizen. So these are the types of things we have to say to parents, to administrators, to funding boards, to justify what we do, our existence, right? And so when we teach these types of students, which is the type of student I used to teach before I ended up at my current institution, um, you know, it was trying to help them connect the dots and see where anthropology would fit into their lives. And you're talking about passion, interest, and, and, and seeing that world connectedness rather than talking about careers. Now imagine the opposite, right? Imagine teaching an institution where all the students in the room have a very clear vision of exactly what they want to be when they grow up. They are career focused, they are driven, they know exactly what they want to do in 5, 10, 15 years. Some of them even have a 30 year plan, which you know is, is quite impressive to think about an 18 year old being able to see themselves 30 years down the line. And these are the types of students I teach at the Culinary Institute of America. Um, my students and those at other vocationally focused institutions leave with very tangible skills. And unlike traditional liberal arts majors where they might be exploring themselves during their four years of undergraduate and then thinking about a job um, at the very last month and a half or maybe the last two days before graduation, um, my students leave often with a job offer, several job offers in hand. Um, they depart college without that angst that most other 22 and 23 year olds experience. They don't generally have that question of what do I want to do with my life and what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, because that has often already been answered, at least in part, before the students even arrive on campus for their first day of orientation. Um, by and large, they come to CIA because they want to do something related to food. We are indeed the Culinary Institute of America. Um, so for those of you who are not really familiar with this institution, I don't want to assume. Um, we are here, of course, in DC. It's very easy to get confused with the other CIA, um, the one in Langley. Um, we like to call ourselves um, the ones that prefer butter. They prefer guns. Econ joke for those who've you've done econ, right? So we are the Culinary Institute of America, and uh, we were founded in 1946 actually as a New Haven Restaurant Institute in downtown New Haven. And yes, we do have a connection with another place in New Haven you may have heard about. They're just this little institution. Um, it was the Culinary Institute of America, which was then founded as a New Haven Restaurant Institute, was founded by Francis Roth, who is a, a, an attorney and Catherine Engel, who was actually married to the then president of Yale University, James Roland Engel. Um, so this institute, the New Haven Restaurant Institute, was founded to help train returning World War II veterans and give them a trade, in essence. Right? And it was a very clear vocational school. We took young men in. At that point, it was all exclusively men. We gave them a trade, and we sent them off to work and, in a job, um, and often in better restaurants and better hotels. In the intervening years, the school changed its name, eventually on, settling on the Culinary Institute of America, and it also moved out of New Haven and to its present day site in Hyde Park, New York, which is also the home of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and other um, historic sites. So over the years, the school has gained a reputation for being the preeminent institution for culinary training. And this reputation really started coming up in the 1970s, not long after the school moved to its present day location in Hyde Park, and it was reinforced by media coverage. So for instance, Life Magazine at that point declared the Culinary Institute the Harvard of Haute Cuisine, very impressive, in 1979, and New York Times food critic Craig Claiborne wrote, Almost every profession has an outstanding training ground. The military has West Point, music has Juilliard, and the culinary world has the Institute. So that reinforced it. It certainly didn't hurt our reputation that um, prestigious culinary figures, those like Julia Child, you may recognize her, um, one of America's 
preeminent and, and many consider to be the first celebrity chef. Um, came and visited many times and also championed the school. Um, we also graduated many illustrious um, alumni and the Culinary Institute America's graduates have routinely taught the best of lists in the culinary world. Um, perhaps the most famous today is Anthony Bourdain who, for those of you who are not necessarily food people but are interested in anthropology, which I hope many of you are, um, he does a bit of an anthro light. You know, he goes to different parts of the world, he engages with the local population, he uses food as a vehicle to speak with the local people and, and talk about issues of local importance. So we have this illustrious alumni list and many of these alumni are working in operating restaurants and other food and beverage um, operations around the world, including some of the best restaurants here in DC. So these students that I teach are not necessarily the target audience for anthropology and other liberal arts subjects. But as I will reflect and comment upon in a moment, these are the types of students that perhaps the most, perhaps have the most to gain from anthropology because it forces them to challenge, question, think in ways they may not have otherwise and may never ever again be pushed to do in the future. For most of these students, this will be the one and only anthropology class that they will ever take in their lifetimes. And what I mean by that is that we offer an anthropology food course. We don't offer a anthropology degree. We don't have the resources for that. Um, we don't have an intro anthropology course. We just have an anthropology food. Although I am happy to report that we will be offering an archaeology food in the near future taught by a colleague. Um, so this is really a one shot for them to get exposed to this field and to think about and consider the issues of anthropology and specifically through the lens of food, which is the field I work in. So occasionally I do have a student who gets the anthropology bug. Um, they will go on and do graduate work in some liberal arts field, often food studies, which is an interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary field that incorporates anthropology and also ethnographic analysis. But these are by and far the exceptions to the rules. My students will by and large be something like this in the future. They will go, and go on to be cooks, chefs, restaurateurs, managers, owner operators, sommeliers, and other hospitality workers. So the value of anthropology and um, other liberal arts subjects at a culinary college can't be discounted because it reflects a broader change um, to what we think of cooks and what would they need to know. Um, as the reputation of the institute has grown over the years, um, we've added branch campuses, we've added programs, and this is part of what um, we can call the professionalization of cooking, right? Um, that we're formalizing the trade, we're formalizing this industry, and, and this shift is something that has been documented in different societies and different places. Um, notably, anthropologist Amy Trubeck has written about the professionalization of cooks in 18th and 19th century France, um, and I've also done so writing about cooks in contemporary 21st century China. And this is interesting because um, cooks don't fit into this definition of professionals by traditional sociological and anthropological definitions, um, by which I mean white collar professions, some of those which I had named at the very start of this presentation, doctors, lawyers, engineers, right? Um, these skills and these professions codified through um, specialized knowledge, formal education, and also set of rules, regulations, and, and professional habits that reinforce who belongs and who doesn't. So this is interesting because with training cooks to be to think about anthropology, we're helping them professionalize, and what it is is that we're encouraging them to think in different ways, um, because it helps us a lot to think about and understand where individuals like myself fit at CIA and why chefs need anthropology. So it's a common misperception that we only teach cooking and only teach future chefs or hospitality workers, um, and to a degree that's true. Our main program is focused. In, in an occupational, um, as an associates in occupational studies, which is two years of heavy hands-on applied work. But as we've grown our campus, we've grown our programs, and we've, we've taken on this attitude of professionalization that chefs need to engage with more than just the physical applied hands-on work. That increasingly they need to be able to address things like ecology, food policy, um, nutrition, obesity, um, food history, um, thinking about food and culture, thinking about food coverage and writing, and this is where our current courses have come in. We have courses now in the ecology of food, food policy, food history, sustainable food systems, food writing, and of course the anthropology of food. So what I will do is comment on some of this and where we fit in and what we do to help our students think about these issues and help them develop that new professional stance that's expected of them. That in the 21st century, chefs are not expected just to do but they're also expected to think and to explain and to communicate often with people who are not from similar backgrounds as themselves. 
So there's a couple things I'm going to highlight at this time in which I do in my classroom that help students who are very accustomed to thinking about point A to B. Right? My students are trained to, to make the souffle rise. And what I mean by that is that it either happens or it doesn't. If you've ever had a souffle, you either have that wonderful moment where a souffle comes out and it puffs up and it rises and you have this beautiful product and you're happy. Or it doesn't and it deflates and you have this sad mess of a dish and you're probably not so happy. Perhaps us normal people are not as, um, our, our emotions are perhaps not as tied, but for others, um, but for the culinary world, this is a very significant moment of you either accomplished a task by physically producing it or you didn't. So with my students, there's three things I want to focus on that I've been training them to do that are broader life skills, but also part of where anthropology sits with them. And for me, the focus is not so much getting them to memorize who Margaret Mead is and Franz Boas was and all these other things that traditional classical anthropology classes focus on in the 101 introduction. But for me, it really is getting them to develop this sense of inquiry and challenge and, and get thinking outside their comfort zone. So first of all, what you see in front of you here is part of this first idea that my students need a room, need room for play. And room for accepting fear. And what I mean by that is my students are so used to that A to B, making the souffle rise and it cooks or it doesn't. And what I do with them is I make them do activities, often hands-on experiential, because they're so accustomed to this, I, that's not, there's no other way for them to operate, um, that challenge them. What I have them do are activities like this. In a lesson about um, technology shifts, the agricultural revolution, the invention of agriculture, um, and the technological revolution, um, I have them grind ancient grains by hand. And what they have to do is they have to find a rock that they think would be an excellent grindstone. <laughs> and in my part of the world, it's a lot of slate and shale. You can imagine what that does for those of you who are archaeologists in the room. I'm, I'm a socioculturalist, but even I know that's not a good idea. So they grind grains, and you can see here that's exactly what they've picked. Um, one of them's got a bit of slate, and they grind and grind, and they realize just how physical material and difficult it is because they're so used to buying industrialized white flour they take for granted how difficult and heartbreaking this process is and it makes them fear a little bit but also accept it because they're so used to following recipes and listening to orders when they have to do something like this where there's no recipe and no prescription they're forced to think the narrative a little bit and also play because normally they don't get to play to the same extent to the same degree and sometimes they get very creative and fun, as you can see. This student decided to uh, find his own grind stick. Um, unfortunately, he realized that using just any old branch doesn't work very well as a pest at all, but um, he tried. The second thing I try to do with my students is give them room for reflection and get them off that mode of yes, chef, to why professor. And by what I mean by this is that instead of the traditional model of education, what Paulo Freire calls the banking model, where they're absorbing education, instead I get them to challenge and think and question. And for instance, um, we do exercises about class, caste, and waste. I'm oh, sorry, class, caste, and identity. And I'm sorry, waste fit in there wrong. But I have them look at things like what are cooks getting paid? And where do they fit in? Because they're asked to absorb all this cultural capital, know all these things about expensive wines, expensive foods. And depending on where they are, um, they may, if they're working in front of house, they may be paid $2.13 for all that labor and all that knowledge. And so what does that mean for them and their careers? Lastly, what I do is try to get them to see themselves in the world. And what I mean by that is if I were to use traditional anthropological methods and talk about traditional anthropological texts and things that anthropology classes at more traditional four-year colleges would use, things like Peggy McIntosh's um, White Privilege and Packing an Invisible Knapsack, it falls flat. Um, the students don't see the relevance of anthropology when it's just general anthropology. They're not interested in the Yamamano. They're not interested in, in those other tribes because they're very vocationally focused. So my goal is always getting them to think through a food lens and use that to engage them in culture and realize that, oh, there's all cultures everywhere and food becomes a good way to talk about this. So I've rewritten the script on certain things. For instance, instead of using Peggy McIntosh's list wholesale, um, I've rewritten it and using examples that are related to things that they can understand and have experience with. In particular, question number two. Um, I have them consider this as a discussion of race and ethnicity. Question number two is I can be pretty sure that my neighbors will not be complained about the smell of my food. And my students who have some type of ethnic identity or heritage often talk about how that is um, something that they've experienced in their own life. And then they start understanding what it means to have these racial and ethnic um, differences, what it means to talk about privilege. So in wrapping up, right, chefs and other vocational learners benefit from anthropology and other liberal arts subjects. And I think in particular in these times when we're talking about um, the need for anthropology, particularly in these difficult 
socioeconomic and political times. Um, it's especially important to consider teaching those who are not within the normal anthropology audience. Students like mine, who are vocational learners, who you know, don't normally get this exposure to different ways of thinking, to asking why. And I think once we start engage, I think you know, the more we engage with that, um, the more we can expand our dialogue with anthropology and, and we can create richer conversations within our field. Thank you very much. Hi, so if you just came in, my name is Audrey Ricky, and I'll be presenting today on service learning, citizenship, and pedagogy, the role of anthropology in structuring learning and civic engagement. Today's emotionally charged political debates about immigration in the US reflect a growing need to increase public understanding about the lives of those at the center of these debates. Increasingly, service learning is being adopted as a pedagogical strategy that brings students into contact with immigrant and other communities. The goal of service learning is to integrate course learning outcomes with host community goals and foster civic engagement among students. Despite the high impact of service learning, it also presents some new challenges. Much like ethnography, service learning involves many uncontrollable variables that can cause discomfort for students. While emotions, both positive and negative, can lead to transformative learning, as Felton et al. 2006 and Keeley 2005 point out, they can also serve as barriers and reinforce stereotypes or erroneous understandings about the social issue, which Featherton and Kelly 2007 and Marullo 1998, for example, found. Given the parallels between service learning and ethnography, anthropologists' role as educators uniquely position us to make significant contributions to the design of service learning. Anthropologists such as Russell Rhodes, Melody Menderes, and Jennifer Guzman have pointed out how anthropology can contribute methodologically with participant observation and reflexivity. Yet anthropologists in general have been slower to enter the discussion about how to design effective service learning pedagogy to address the emotions that surface for students during the course. As an anthropologist and instructor of service learning courses that partner with a local NGO that assists refugees and immigrants, I drew upon participant observation, my own reflexivity as an educator, and student surveys to design and test a pedagogical model for structuring undergraduate service learning. This model focuses on helping students reflexively work with and through their emotions to make sense of their participant observation and better understand the local refugee and immigrant communities. The model builds upon the literature for structuring service learning. Drawing on the work of Erickson, Mrezro, and Keegan, Cunningham and Grossman, 2009, identify these three steps for transformative learning. They highlight the need to provide students with, and I quote, a reflexive scaffolding, end quote, that integrates a growing awareness of self and structural barriers. This is where my model picks up. For the pilot study of the model, undergraduate students worked with immigrants and refugees from various countries at a local NGO, volunteering at least 68 hours in either English or citizenship classes as part of their service learning project. Based on topics recommended from the NGO, students produce learning activities that could be used to help clients improve their knowledge of US language, customs, history, and political system. The model itself involves five steps. Step one includes a pre and post identity reflection paper that asks students to explicitly reflect on their social identities and that of those they are working with. Uh, this is an important first step for promoting self-awareness. On the screen are some prompts that students were given in this particular pilot, and for the post-identity, they were asked to respond to the exact same three questions, but this time focus on what was different and what had remained the same as a result of their experiences. An important next step in preventing emotional barriers to learning is to ask students early on to identify their emotions going into the project and also identify potential problems and solutions. 
So here on the screen are some prompts, uh, which took the form of the first critical reflection for the pilot study. And uh, for the problem solution chart, students were asked to think of three possible problems that they could be encountering, and then to come up with three possible solutions uh, for those. And what's really important is, as an instructor, when you get this back, to go back to the students and share in the aggregate the results, particularly the emotions that were coming up, uh, because this is going to help students know that emotions like frustration or nervousness is normal and something that many people are anticipating and experiencing. Also, the problem solution chart, by discussing some examples, uh, it helps students understand, okay, this is what I might run into, and then also they have tangible takeaways. And for example, you notice option one, sometimes students um, brainstorm doing something new, but if you kind of collectively bring in the knowledge, doing something new may not mean much of anything unless we know exactly what that is. So maybe trying basic English or switching to drawing images on the board when you run into a communication challenge. The next step is sharing culturally relevant information about the service learning community. And the, the idea here is really to avoid emotion-based interpretations that could block learning. So I'm not promoting an overgeneralization of a whole group of people or stereotypes, but rather to let students know, for example, that concepts of time and punctuality do differ uh, in terms of across different cultural groups, as well as eye contact. These kind of basic things that maybe naive realism might lead someone to a negative assumption about a person if they didn't know this going into the site. And then step four involves a combination of readings on ethnic graphic methods and of frameworks for understanding structure, structural challenges and inequalities. And it's key to combine this with in-class activities. Because what that is going to do, it's not only going to give students that framework, those alternate frameworks in some cases, to interpret what they're seeing on site, but to also give them experience and more of kind of a safe environment, the classroom, to help them process their experiences. So for example, you might do, and this is what the pilot did, was an on-campus participation exercise. So during the actual class time, you go in small groups to do a participant observation exercise. Following classroom, you come back and it's the class you talk about what you found, you walk through together that analysis and connect it to a particular concept that you're reading in class. Also doing any type of role plays or simulations that puts students at the center in terms of the experience helps them to really kind of process some of these frameworks like Bourdieu's forms of capital and Moline's intersectionality may feel kind of foreign and distant until they experience it through some type of role play. And that really allows them to uh, recognize kind of unarticulated assumptions and overall kind of reduce their anxiety going into the, the service learning projects and as, as they're unfolding as well. And the final step, step five, includes multiple structured critical reflections with interval due dates. And this part is really crucial for helping students work with and through their emotions and basically to kind of articulate and divide out their assumptions from the actual descriptions. I combined uh, Patty Clayton and Sarah Ash's deal method with, Ed with Dr. Edward Solowski's three-part structure for journal entries to help students discern if their conclusions were actually based more on assumption than on the data. And I like Clayton and Ashton's deal model because it's really easy to remember. You can tell students, here's the deal. You want to describe what you're seeing, you want to examine it, and you want to articulate learning, being kind of connecting it to a term, a concept in class. And what Dr. Edward Solowski's model does, it gives a really nice visual framework for this. A sort of description, the raw notes, those are in regular font. And then students are required to put in italics their emotions and their assumptions. So they have to reflect on that. And then lastly, in a bolded section, they talk about their academic connections to the concepts uh, from the course. Also, having those interval due dates, such as every two weeks, volunteer two hours, and submit a critical reflection helps students manage their time and gives them time to process what they're experiencing. It also gives you time as well to grade the material and give it back to them with comments to help them work through maybe some emotions that they're struggling with or some challenges that they're experiencing on site. 
To test how effective this model was, it was employed in an introductory cultural anthropology course with 24 students who represented a variety of ethnic and racial backgrounds. Most were first year students and all were non-majors. I collected survey data from students about the model and did a content analysis of their identity reflection papers and service learning projects. And I coded for such things as emotions, changing perceptions, and desire for civic engagement. Returning to the model's steps, the associated data illustrates the degree to which these steps work to support students in their projects and growth as engaged and informed citizens. For example, um, in terms of the top three emotions students reported throughout the service learning experience, these were anxiety, nervousness, happiness, and frustration. But they worked through these, and they were able to dive deeper into the meanings. And one of the things that helped them to do that was that problem solution chart. So 16 out of 20 students rated it a 4 or 5 out of 5 in terms of helpful or very helpful for their service learning experiences. When I asked students about the on-campus participation exercise, uh, 16 out of 20 students rated it again a 4 or 5 out of 5 in terms of very helpful for their service learning. And I also saw in student comments, they were reflecting back and indicating, for example, such things as the role plays that were helping them. Uh, so I'm going to just quote one student comment here. The student reflected, experiencing the role play and volunteering with the Syrian women woke me up from just book and social media stories. I witnessed how people are treated. I learned what it's like to be different and not the social norm. While 12 out of 20 students ranked the Deal Sowalski format of 4 or 5 out of 5 in terms of helpfulness for their service learning project, I actually saw an improvement in students' awareness of their own personal bias and assumptions and emotions and how that influenced the conclusions they were drawing. And this was based off a comparison with a previous upper division anthropology service learning course, which was at the same location but did not use this particular format for reporting their, their field notes. And then finally, returning to students' reflections and their post-service learning papers, what I found was that across the board there was some increase, either in an increased civic engagement desire or in terms of their self-awareness and that of others. So I'm just going to share a couple of comments that are representative of the larger pool. So one student wrote, and I quote, observing and helping the citizenship class was very eye-opening to my roles that I have in life. And the student was talking about the role as a citizen. I got more into politics and have even gotten the opportunity to enact my right to vote. It never intrigued me, and because of the citizenship class and this awakening, I got involved to not only help myself, but to help the students in the citizenship classes. So the students showing here self-awareness as well as civic engagement. Another student wrote, and I quote, it opened my eyes on the reality of the refugee situation going on today around the world. I made sure I voted, and I also started to volunteer at new places ever since I started my volunteering at the NGO. So next time I hear the topic of refugees brought up, I will definitely share with others what I learned and what I saw to hopefully teach others about the settlement of refugees. So here the students showing awareness of others as well as civic engagement in terms of volunteering outside of the requirement for the course. And then lastly, I want to share this comment uh, from a student who together showed evidence for transformative learning. And what we mean here is like a paradigm shift or a worldview shift in how, in how they saw the world. So this student wrote, first I had some bias going into the service learning project. I thought that the refugees would be exactly like they portray them on the media. This experience has been life changing for me. I have experienced so much emotion, overcome a lot of bias, and I have learned that helping others really is my calling in life. The student went on to say that they are volunteering as well outside of the regular kind of class requirements. When I see the ways some of the people are living, it makes me sad. They came to this country to get away from poverty and violence, but they are put in places with poverty and violence. So here at the end, the student showing structure awareness as well as civic engagement and that changing awareness of self. 
So to conclude with a quote, as Bradley Levinson explains, citizenship education means, and I quote, to educate the members of a social group, to imagine their social belonging, and exercise their participation as democratic citizens, end quote. For service learning educators, the social group is both the students and community members. As these students' comments illustrate, this pedagogical model helps students become more self-aware citizens, which involves both understanding themselves in relation to others and the structural challenges in place. At the same time, the service learning project assisted a diverse population of immigrants and refugees in gaining the language and cultural knowledge skills needed to be active members in US society. Following the theme of this conference, anthropology matters. And the discipline has and can continue to play an important role in designing pedagogical frameworks that assist instructors across disciplines in helping their students grapple with complex and emotionally charged issues and grow as scholars and responsible citizens. So I'd like to wrap up by thanking the NGO community partner, the instructors and clients, as well as the Intro to Cultural Anthropology students who participated in this study, and finally for uh, the grant support from IUPUI RISE program. Thank you. Unfortunately, Angela Jinx is not able to be with us today, so we'll move right to Shannon Talinko's presentation, Engaging White Working Class Students in the Struggle for Equality Through Anthropologically Informed Pedagogies. Thank you. Anthropology and anthropological pedagogy saved me is a white working class kid so far as understanding from where I came and to where I needed to go. This paper elaborates on this notion as well as how my work, which includes teaching and academic advising, has been informed and shaped by this subject and its forms of pedagogy. As teachers, scholars, and practitioners, anthropologists must develop praxis and agility to explore new audiences and engage more students in the struggle for equity by raising consciousness around the causes for inequity. Our struggles are often used to divide us, but I anxious, anxiously search for the ways in which they connect us. In addition to connecting struggle, humanity must help one another to contextualize struggle. Educational anthropologists have recently challenged one another to think more expansively about what true solidarity and resistance might look like. Indeed, what they must look like in the post-Trump era. While I didn't set out to focus on Trump, partly because I am also reflecting on moments well before but leading up to Trump's election, it seems that the tenor of this era is weighing heavily and calling more of us to action and activism. And I am keenly aware that writing and reflecting on white, working class, and or rural Americans has in the last year or so become all the rage, thanks to portrayals of these oft overlapping populations in moderate to progressive forms of media leading up to and since the 2016 presidential election. These articles maintain the narrative that Trump was elected by white, racist, resentful, working class people and perpetuate the idea that economic injustice is something for which only poor whites, but not poor blacks, may have reason for their disillusionment. Yet the American National Election Study found that two thirds of Trump voters were not poor and that white non-Hispanic voters without college degrees making below the median household income made up only 25% of Trump voters. ta Coates writes that white political pundits are being modest by giving the white working class all of the credit as Trump's performance among all whites was dominant. Perry Gilmore, in the latest volume of Anthropology and Education, points to how this modesty clouded the media's in-depth data pred predictions that Trump would lose. That white supremacy infects American society and is taken for granted is not a new phenomenon. As Shirazi notes, there is precedent, and this time the veneer of neoliberalism, neoliberal inclusion has been partially removed from the ideology of American exceptionalism. 
Bonilla Silva notes in Racism Without Racist that unlike most social scientists who posit that educated, mostly white, middle-class white folks are racially tolerant and hence more likely to support the struggle for racial equality, his research suggests that working class women are significantly more likely than any other segment of the white population to be racially progressive. In this spirit, and with these data and insights, I ask us all to keep faith in our white, rural, working class students and actively engage them in topics around inequality and injustice. Adrienne Marie Brown urges community organizers to work within fractals, which is to see our small daily actions as part of the movement toward making change. Frere pointed to, fra to praxis, in which as teachers and educators, we continuously take action and reflect in order to eradicate oppression for our individual students and their world. For Friere, the ability to communicate various realities and to listen to and learn from our students makes us better educators. Those various voices of oppression must include students from urban, rural, indigenous, non-white, and, and white working class backgrounds. Kathy Davidson has been examining the ways in which those of us in higher education can make college more relevant to the challenges students face today. What bigger and sadder perennial challenge is there in the US besides racial inequality and those institutionally, institutionally grounded racist practices like housing segregation that support and perpetuate it? Housing segregation maintains the divide between black and white or whitened citizens, documented or not, and contributes to a negative racial climate in every corner of American society. And I see this play out in the classroom. White students from all socioeconomic backgrounds are stunned into silence. When we discuss the condition of predominantly, predominantly black public schools, students of color uh, feelings of loneliness, on a predominantly white college campus, and the perception that Penn State is actually not very diverse compared to the schools and neighborhoods from which our students of color tend to matriculate. But it's also been hopeful to witness white students developing critical thinking skills and moving through their own identity development as white allies and accomplices for racial justice while honoring the need for positive identity development for students who are not white. For the rest of this paper, I provide an auto-ethnographic account on growing up white working class in rural America and being drawn to higher education. Reflect on teaching introduction to cultural anthropology at a community college and share my experiences as an academic advisor and teacher after the 2016 election on topics that are a response to not only his policies, but also to the rhetoric of a divided America. Put together, I offer suggestions for making anthropological pedagogy more ubiquitous on our college campuses as a means towards social justice, inclusivity, and human dignity. dignity. So I still don't know what I want to be um, when I grow up. Did it, is it not showing? Not showing, okay. That's okay. <laughs> So, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up then. Maybe I did. I wanted to be a princess or something. Um, but I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And I wonder, is the habitus in which I grew to blame? The reality is that I have students from all socioeconomic backgrounds who are also lost. In advising and student development, we talk about self-authorship, which is the ability to craft your own goals and life plans. In particular, it's been used to defend against helicopter parenting, which seems to confine white middle class students. One could see how a theory like self-authorship, when approached this way, could have limitations as it fails to take into account structural and contextual factors related to the reasons low income families, regardless of race, send their children to college, which is to get a well paying job when they graduate. Still, majors in the liberal arts do not fare well among any socioeconomic or socially constructed population. Although the industry of higher education via Jeff Salingo has been trying to make the case similar to Davidson's, urging that we remake higher education for our age and that the liberal arts makes one world ready as opposed to workforce ready. 
But Davidson and Salingo were sadly not available for comment when my parents were sending me off to college in the 1990s. They understandably pressured me to study and stick with business, which didn't work out so well for me. So I went on to graduate school to study what else but higher education because I enjoyed helping my undergraduate peers to navigate the system. <laughs> Studying higher education and eventually anthropology made me curious about the reasons why some rural teens go to college and others do not. Wasn't it beaten into all of our heads that jobs were scarce in Appalachia? like it was mine, and that college was not a choice, but a necessity and a way out of working class drudgery. Even my great grandfathers dissuaded their sons from coal mining as far back as the 1950s. The point of the American dream in my corner of working class life was always to do more and do better, which, at least according to the media, is not how all Appalachians currently feel. Despite the frustrations between my parents and I regarding the money spent on my business education, ironically, they have come to understand how my education as a student of anthropology has been formative to who I am today and the value that I have provided back home among family members, our church family, and next semester with community organizers in Johnstown who are peacefully confronting racism, as well as within higher education. So for several semesters, I taught an Introduction to Cultural Anthropology course at a community college in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. In this role, I tried to be creative when covering what I anticipated as controversial topics, having an understanding of someone who grew up in communities similar to my students. To qualify, the Johnstown community is predominantly white. While part of my teaching was online, I can say with some confidence that few, if any, of my students were African American. The students taking classes were in many cases, though, the first in their families to attend college. They also tended to be more socially and also religiously conservative, which shouldn't have created a lack of empathy, um, but it was often a hindrance when some kind of behavior, tradition, or value that anthropologists considered to be social, cultural, or biological uh, was regarded as sinful in that context. For example, when covering sex, gender, and sexuality, a section I anticipated would be ripe for controversy, I somewhat hastily, but in retrospect wisely, told students to wear the hat of an anthropologist when writing their papers and participating in discussions online or in person. I explained they would be graded, I explained that we, they would be graded on their ability to think like an anthropologist, but they wouldn't have to believe all of it, um, even though it was science, um, but they would need to try on the anthropological theories and approaches. My discussion questions were like the following. What do we know about how gender is presented and sexuality is practiced cross-culturally? Is how we handle this in the US similar or different? If people are born intersexed, and therefore biological sex is not binary, how can we say that gender and sexuality are binary? I supported some of this processing with current events articles. My favorite covered two very different parental and therapeutic approaches for children who identified as the gender opposite to what they were assigned at birth. I was able to gently challenge students when their religious beliefs did not align with biological or social science research. I credit my mentors and friends, Drs. Brett Williams, Sibia Prince, and Rachel Watkins, who, while I was a student at American University, helped um, and was helping um, them to teach or getting ready to start teaching my own courses. Um, they taught me that the point of the introductory courses was to engage students in the subject. Um, it was crucial to make them a little fun, somewhat challenging, and incredibly informative. And this was anthropological pedagogy at its finest. This is an excellent way to study the world and a great way to engage students around issues to which they may not have previously been aware, particularly around their own social locations and identities as they are developing into adulthood. For Friere, a truly hum humanist endeavor, may um, forget, I'm sorry, a, very, a truly humanist educator may forget that their fundamental objective is to fight alongside the people for the recovery of the people's stolen humanity, not to win the people over to their side. This, I believe, is how I was able to create the perception that my lectures were not political, but scientific and undeniably humanistic. In a similar vein, I have been thinking more 
in my role as academic advisor at Penn State for the last several years, how I can help my students to not operate as expectant, needy customers, but rather in ways that help them to not only find themselves vocationally and personally, but also to think about the bigger picture and how their decisions can impact the world around them. That's my son booing the Trump Hotel at the Women's March <laughs> earlier this year. My full-time work is to academically advise undergraduate students at Penn State. A few years ago, I started to look at how academic advising can and should lead to social justice for my students in the world. Academic advising is a combination of teaching, guiding, and advocating, and relates not only to academic matters, but also matters that may impede or enhance education and ultimately lead to degree completion. This means that a student who cannot afford their education without working a part-time job may get less out of the experience and opportunities than a student who doesn't have to work. In terms of teaching, I also have the opportunity to suggest to students who think that a liberal arts degree is not worth the money, that in fact it is, and that as citizens of the world, they have a responsibility to think more broadly, not just about what they will do for a living, but how their career choice can impact the world or make a difference in the world. I talk to students about purpose, which means finding that sweet spot between vocation, passion, talent, and values. What can they offer, the, offer that the world needs that, that also helps them to wake up in the morning? Campus climate, in terms of how well students feel included on a college campus, has also received much needed attention. We can thank student voices for that, but then we must also be in tune and listen to those voices. For me, I was led to meet with students from underrepresented backgrounds, become involved in work where I have the opportunity as part of a team to give recommendations to our university president around racial and ethnic diversity and inclusion, and to teach some one credit courses on prejudice and everyday diplomacy. Sadly, there have also been times where I've had to show care for students by reporting concerning behaviors and activities by pro-Trump white supremacist students and groups. Some students can't be reached through anthropological pedagogy and in my mind are best left to the authorities who often are already aware of these groups and activities I'm coming to learn. Yet I also get nervous about turning potential allies away. So I'm left with thinking more and more about how to best help our students and one another connect through similar and disparate struggles and then help them to contextualize these struggles. Finally, to where from here? I will continue what I've been doing and demand intentionality in how we teach our students within anthropology and through anthropological methods. In a Frarian pedagogy, we are in a constant state of reflecting and doing, and our students can be trained to do the same. Perhaps it's possible to help our white students develop healthier forms of white identity related to privilege and dismantling oppression. We can challenge our colleague, colleagues who police the tone of student voice without pro providing guidance or support and participate in curricular and co-curricular development that helps both our students and colleagues to connect and contextualize struggle. I promise to not give up on myself, you, or our white working class students. Our next presenter is Sherry Briller. Her presentation is entitled, Teaching Public Engagement, Preparing Students Who Can Confidently Explain Why Anthropology Matters. Thank you, Audrey. Hello, everybody. Thanks for staying till the bitter end. Some of you know me from other contexts, and you know I'm an end-of-life researcher, so this is actually a very familiar speaking slot for me. OK. Well, I'm really pleased to be talking today about a topic I care a great deal about, so I made it my title that Audrey just read, Teaching Public Engagement, and then I kind of upped the ante this time and said, preparing students who can confidently explain why anthropology matters. This is, this is a new way of doing this. Um, so just to be real, uh, I think about this topic liter literally every day in my job role, which involves um, helping to think about and guide the expansion of applied and practicing anthropology at Purdue. And I also, also in my work with COPA, the Consortium of Practicing and Applied Anthropology Programs, I've had a chance to talk with a lot of different people who are interested in this topic and are trying different approaches out for teaching it. Um, and I think it's a really crucial subject matter. Today I want to tell you a little bit about, oh, hey, what's going on here? Oh, there we go. 
Um, so as it said in my abstract in the program, today I want to tell you a little bit about um, the design of a new graduate class that we have in public engagement. I've taught it two times at Purdue now. And then I want to go beyond that um, and give a, more, a little bit more extended teaching example of how I actually teach the course material. And I think this is important to do because I've been to and given a lot of presentations where we say we should be doing this, right? So today I want to talk a little bit more about the how and, um, and tell you a little bit more about um, an assignment that I give. So how can we teach these skills? Um, I really started thinking a lot about teaching public engagement when I wrote this book uh, a number of years ago now with my, um, with my colleague Amy Goldmacher, um, and it's a set of professional development exercises for anthropology students. And in the book, we have two main kinds of examples. Um, the first kinds of exercises that we have for students are about under understanding yourself as an anthropologist. And these exercises involve thinking on the front end about what kinds of publicly engaged work you actually might be setting out to do. The second kinds of exercises that we have in the book are about representing yourself as an anthropologist. So that involves a lot of creating documents that might help you to get jobs, um, things like resumes, CVs, nowadays portfolios, and so forth. Um, the kinds of things that show employers what anthropological knowledge and skills you possess and why they might be interested in those things, or I guess in terms of our session, why anthropology matters, right? So um, that's when I really started thinking about teaching this publicly engaged, um, about teaching this kind of class, and it led to what became this course description, um, which is the course that I'm teaching now. How Public Anthropology is a course about both using and communicating anthropological knowledge. And so when we teach this, um, uh, it's basically a graduate seminar course, we talk about what it means to work as an anthropologist, what it means to be a public intellectual, I guess that dovetails with the presentations we've just been hearing, and m perhaps most effect, um, importantly, if you want to do this work, about how you might go about effectively working with stakeholders, presenting anthropological information, and using that in an action-oriented way to make some kinds of social or other types of change. So that's what we set out to do in the class. And then these, this is the, what the learning goals, oh, sorry. This, these are what the learning goals actually are. Um, and we look at various people who've been successful in this realm over time. So we look at some classic figures, people like Margaret Mead and Boaz, you know, who did this back in the day. And then we look at a lot of modern figures, even including some who are speaking here at this conference, to understand how various people are going out and achieving this in their, in their own work. Um, looking back over time all the way to the present today. And then the, the, the important um, piece of the puzzle for the students themselves is the stuff you see down at the bottom to gain more critical thinking skills and to then to be able to go out and um, use these types of skills in your own areas of interest. For the sake of time today, um, I won't, I won't you know, go over this more, but basically the learning outcomes then turn around and say, how are you going to do this for yourself in, this, in the type of publicly engaged work that you're setting out to do. So now I want to um, change over and talk about a specific assignment that I give called the generations assignment because, well, I told you I'm an end-of-life researcher, but before that I was a gerontologist. So, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how I use a piece of my own work in writing um, from being an applied cultural and medical anthropologist, and um, from my own background as a community aging practitioner, to sort of demonstrate to students how they can do this type of things. So in order to do that, I use, uh, this is the cover of a journal issue that my colleague Andrea Sankar at Wayne State and I um, guest edited. And the journal is called Generations. You may not know it if you're not an aging practitioner, so I will tell you about it. Um, basically, this is the official journal of the American Society on Aging. It's a key resource for aging professionals. I say that because it's received by 5,000 aging practitioners every month, and they read about different types of current issues in the field of aging, and, um, and that, that's a gamut of things. That's policy issues, things about aging research, clinical issues, all types of different topics. So um, about five years ago, um, Andre and I were approached to guest edit a special theme issue. Um, I believe, truthfully, that they had never had an anthropologist 
do this. And um, they asked us to focus on a particular topic, which we did, which is aging, um, aging and ritual and the significance of ritual in later life. And to tell aging practitioners, this is where it comes to teaching public engagement, why that was relevant for them and why they might care about ritual in later life. So that's what our special issue is about. We have a longer introduction where we explain all this, but basically our main goal was to explore the benefits and meaning of ritual, talk about how it can validate, support, and enrich older people's lives, and what aging practitioners could do to engage in this most classic type of anthropological concept. The reason um, I bring this up as an example is you're gonna see in a couple of minutes um, steps I have the students go through to do this on their own topic of interest. Because lo and behold, they're not all interested in aging and ritual, who knew? But, <laughs> so anyway, the framing of our special issue, it's a tribute issue, some of you might know um, the anthropologist Barbara Meyerhoff. She did a lot of groundbreaking work on ritual in old age. And this cover, um, this is the cover of her widely acclaimed ethnography, Number Our Days. It happens to focus on um, older adults living in Venice, California, um, who all attend the same senior center. And even though Meyerhoff didn't label herself as an applied anthropologist, I have chosen to apply that label to her over time. And um, what she was interested in, the publicly engaged part of her work, was she was interested in how this particular community of elders um, who were considered uh, poor, socially marginalized, um, somewhat isolated and increasingly frail, how they used ritual to strengthen um, both continuity and community um, in later life. So the part where it's important for public engagement, and we have a whole session of class where we talk about this, is what happened after she produced this ethnography, because it looks just like this. It's a classic ethnographic book. You open it, you read it like a book. And then it became a lot of other things, which is part of the inspiration and why I use it to teach about doing publicly engaged work. So this ethnography um, was eventually adapted as an art exhibit. It became a stage play. And then it became an Oscar award winning uh, best short documentary. So a lot of things came off, you know, if you went to the book fair, you'd pick up a book like this. A lot of things came off of this ethnography. So I use this as a model to talk about how an anthropologist could use their ethnographic work to have a lot of community impact. And I also talk about it personally and how very inspirational this book was and a touchstone for me in my career early on in the anthropology of aging and in becoming a gerontologist and how it influenced my own way of working. So I hope at this point that the students are inspired to try something. Okay, so I then explained to them the process that we're gonna do, um, I talk about why, uh, in our case, we wanted to communicate with a large audience of aging practitioners, and we wanted to show them how ritual is infused in the everyday life of older adults. That was thing number one. We wanted to show why it would be beneficial for those who work with elders, community aging practitioners, to understand, this is the very classic anthropological um, explanation, how rituals, rituals role, what rituals role is in structuring social life. And we wanted to introduce the very anthropological idea that rituals connect people through the shared sentiments and meanings they create. So we wanted, in just to sum, we wanted to use these key ideas about ritual to speak in a new and important ways to practitioners working in aging about what the, con the anthropological concept of ritual really has to offer for them and why they should work with it. So with these learning goals in mind, um, basically then I invite the students to, um, to try it themselves. So this is how the assignment works. Um, it could be modified in other ways. I just happen to use this as my teaching example. So first they read the special issue. It'd be nice if they read the whole thing, but they at least read the introduction to get where we're coming from. And um, that's where we give the framing of why is this anthropological concept salient for, um, for, for practitioners. And then they, um, they take a look at what we do, and then using our model, um, using our, mo our work as a model, they try and do the same thing themselves. So here's, uh, this was last year. These are some of, you know, just to show you it's really not all about aging and ritual. 
I might be really interested in that. Um, here's some concepts people picked to work with last year. So there are things you're familiar with and things you can find books on downstairs, caregiving, kin. Um, some of them you see are about, you know, about social relations. The ones below are, are a little different. Ways, discuss, social justice. And they do the same type of activity. So here are the steps that they go through. They select the anthropological concept they want to use. And then they, um, they do some research on it. So they might, uh, they, I usually encourage them to do the research a couple of different ways. I encourage them, um, some of them are, you know, they're picking things that their own master's projects or dissertations are on. But I encourage them to also go back and look at an introductory anthropology textbook and kind of return to the roots of understanding when they first might have met up with this concept and see how it gets explained out there. Then from there, they can look at, you know, any other literature, any other stuff they want to. So once they feel that they have their concept sort of under control and that they have a good anthropological understanding of it, then the next step of the assignment is to identify what specific audiences they want to communicate with. So in my case, I was telling you, um, I want to communicate with these 5,000 aging practitioners. So they pick some, they pick some um, audience, usually one or two major audiences they want to communicate with, and um, then they say what they want to do. So they might not all want to you know, produce, you know, produce a written journal issue. They might want to do something else. They might want to make a skit. They might want to make a toolkit. They might want to make something else for practice. Um, then they um, actually make the definition themselves. And I usually warn them that they have to leave a little time in their planning during the week, because this usually takes them longer time than they think it's going to. Um, so they try this a few times until they have it under control. And they're supposed to bring back um, a definition that is user friendly for the audience. The first round of this, we usually have varying degrees of success. Um, and then they give some examples of how they would explain out the concept to the audience. Um, I also have them do, at this point, also sort of a self-reflective um, step where they talk about, well, why do you actually think it's an important concept? And why do you think this particular audience would need to know about it? And why would they need to know about it for practice or for some form of social action or social change? And then I also ask them to drill down more and not just I mean, whatever, I'm really interested in aging ritual, but to try and back up and understand what's actually interesting about this concept more broadly. Because it might be a concept you think about every day, but maybe everybody else is not quite as interested in it as you are. How can you get them to understand why it's important? Um, and then, like I say, what's its, what's its um, implications for policy and what work should actually be done in this area? Then they're usually ready to write and go from there. Um, just for the sake of time today, I just want to tell you about the last part of the assignment. The last part of the assignment is a self-reflection about doing it. Um, they write about the process. I'll show you a couple of student comments in a minute. Um, but basically, in addition to talking about uh, how it got done and how they feel their result turned, turned out, we talk about the actual process of whether it was easy or hard or challenging or why it might be difficult to fit work they're already doing academically onto some type of um, social justice or other types of social change work they might want to do and what they can learn from the whole assignment. So just because we're a little short um, today on time, I'll just cut to the, to the chase because um, I think obviously in this type of pedagogy presentation, students should speak last and loudest, right? So these are some things students said about this assignment. They said, and this was said over and over again, that it was much more difficult than they thought it was going to be. They said it was helpful because they were able to plan better how they were going to um, organize their ideas and have the right language to talk about some of the audiences they're interested in. Um, one of the things they consistently talk about is this middle quote. One of the most difficult parts of the assignment was learning how to write for a different audience. And they talk about, and this is probably a commentary on us, they talk a lot about being in school. Some of them talked a lot about being in graduate school and how they had to unlearn some writing habits that they had, and they were very good at peer reviewing each other, and they're like, that is very jargonistic. You should not talk like that. And they talk, and they talk to each other like that constantly, but it was harder to deal you know, with their own work that way. Um, but this was a good piece of the assignment. 
And they said they liked everyone getting to comment on what was included. And um, the other thing they found hard was they found it hard to cut back because a lot of them were writing either theses or dissertations, and they had a tendency to want to go on and on about this concept that they loved so much. So learning how to write about it and communicate about it and talk about it concisely was actually one of the most challenging parts. So since we're out of time, I'll just give you um, this final thought about this assignment, this is what a student said. Um, this class drew from multiple perspectives in grooming what she called a public intellectual with the skills and competencies required to succeed beyond the academic corridors. I learned a great deal. So this is, um, I'm happy to share the activity with you and it's something I'm playing around with. It probably will become, I'm gonna do a next book of similar activities to this, but it's been a lot of fun to work with it so far. So thanks for listening. Thank you, and this is actually a recorded session for AAA, so we definitely welcome questions, so we ask if you could walk up to the mic to, to place those. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the challenges or how any of you might address when you have students who are interested in doing service learning or public engagement, how do you um, address the community's concerns about their needs and not the students' needs? And also, how do you um, figure out how to not burn those bridges in the community. So as faculty, we will, we're at the university, students go through and they pass through. My concern is one, um, with individuals who live in the community, maybe not or on organizations, but also individuals that you may be working, students may be working with, how they're not overburdened by the university. And then also that trust and rapport that's needed to create those alliances. That's a great question. Uh, so a couple of things is trying to start really early in the planning process and meeting with the community partner to, to see, okay, here are some of the objectives and things that we are looking at in our class. How does that overlap with some things that are, you're concerned about? And you can come in with some ideas and that's what I had initially done to see if the community partner was interested and they happened to be. And then from there we built. I also put in my syllabus something for students where I tell them they are representative representative of the university and they should be respectful and kind of treat this as like an, a job experience. Uh, so they're, they're treating it as kind of a professional interaction uh, with, with the community and the clients. Um, and then um, also uh, the community partner comes in and they do an orientation like they would uh, with any type of volunteer. So there's kind of that, that interfacing at the beginning I think is really important. And then um, dropping in, like for example, I would even recommend doing your own participant observation at the site before you set up the service learning project, and that way you can help identify some maybe unarticulated needs as well. Okay, um, I think it's a, a good question. I agree with everything that Audrey said. I might be a little advantaged because a lot of the time I'm working with older adults and drawing on another classic anthropological idea, of knowledge transmission between generations. Sometimes they feel that they should help out. And, um, and I, you know, also I think just to kind of make the stakes lower, um, we say this is a good partnership and these students can be helpful and they may, you know, they can go out and find some kinds of information you might be interested in. We work a lot with our local city and they're really interested in people's perceptions of the city and, you know, our students have the time to do that. So it is, it is a win-win in that sense. It needs management. Um, but we also remind, especially like older folks working with younger folks, that these people are starting out and they're learners and um, trying to understand that. So in, in a way it's a real advantage because um, a lot of times the students approach um, these topics with a lot of interest and a lot of enthusiasm and a fresh perspective. And, um, and a lot of times on the other side there are things uh, people in the community, especially older people, might want to say. And so I think just really, uh, it's a really great chance in our society which should happen more to promote that kind of intergenerational interaction. So, so I tried to start out that it, that it is a really positive thing and something that, 
that should maybe be potentially going on. Maybe this is a wider social goal that we should have. So that's been helpful, I think. Well, I'll just, I'll just uh, reiterate the importance of maybe doing it yourself first. Mm -hmm. And it not only builds connections, but you do kind of see these unseen challenges that you might not have seen otherwise. That's been really key in the things that we've done, for sure. Welcome. Other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael. Thanks again for everybody who shared with us today. One of my questions is um, on the advice that you know anthropologists were going to be in a position to be offering solutions and uh, perspectives to implementing change. My question is how to do this when we find ourselves in an arena, an environment, a community, or a society that isn't really conscious of the teachings of anthropology, or maybe to the extent doesn't have respect for anthropology. So that's a really great question to ask, and um, these are just some thoughts. Um, please do not take this as the gospel truth. Um, I, I deal some similar challenges with that every day in my work, um, teaching at the Culinary Institute of America, um, because I'm, I'm dealing with students who, by and large, will probably never need anthropology ever again, in, in a formal academic sense, right? They're never going to get an anthro degree because it's not a thing that's offered at my institution. So it's, it's not gonna appear formally. Um, and I think one of the greatest things I can do for them is to get them to take away the bigger message of, of, of anthropological thinking, but also of broader liberal arts thinking. And it's also being, it's that idea of not having an answer and being able to go with change and, and be able to adapt. And so instead of feeling like you have to be able to have a solution at the end of an hour and 20 minutes of lecture on whatever, um, or feeling like you ended a 15, minute, 15 semester, 15 week course of a semester um, able to have something very tangible, concrete, right? Um, because liberal arts classes don't often, particularly intro 101 classes, do not leave someone with something very concrete and tangible in, in, in the way that my students normally expect, right? My students expect to finish a course, know how to make certain things or do certain things. By the end, you know, you can make a souffle or you know how to butcher a cow or you know how to make a cake or certain things. Um, it's leaving that with the sense that you can at least address change and, and be able to be resilient and be hopeful, hopefully, um, and to be comfortable with not having an answer and, and be able to see yourself in that. And, and for me as an educator as well, being able to feel confident and say, you know, I'm, I'm just teaching them to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think that's something is a, is a solace as well. I guess I would add, um, I think something students are really looking for, maybe especially if they either think they're training to be an applied practicing anthropologist um, or they're just taking a class like that, is they're looking sometimes for you to model ways of working. Um, so I'm pretty upfront with my students and I tell them, you know, I was a community aging practitioner before I was a researcher and before I was an academic. And so I kind of explain to them, um, so for example, if we're gonna go in and um, try and understand something that's going on, in a healthcare setting, like the dynamic in the waiting room or certain kinds of interactions that occur in the clinic. Um, I sort of model and show for them, you know, I, when also what I tell the healthcare staff, it's like, we have a different role. I'm not there to treat any patient, you know, A, because I'm not legally <laughs> able to, and nor would you want me to. Like, that's not what I'm there to do. I'm there to watch what goes on, talk to you about this context, under, know how to understand that and analyze that as a social scientist. Like, so I kind of help them frame up telling people like what they're there for, and I think that's a really useful skill that people really should learn in school to be able to be useful if they're gonna work in a, um, any kind of change-oriented way as a social scientist. So I think um, we probably have too little emphasis on that in our education right now. And um, so in addition to being able to be good at those things, describe what you're seeing, um, learn how to analyze data, I think that learning how to really set up those interactions and, and maybe make sure they, they kind of go well, or I don't know, there's no way to say they really go properly, but kind of that they do go well and that they are um, you know, 
co-created and negotiated, I think those are really important skills that are probably underemphasized in anthropological education and training today. We should do more there. Yeah, I think too, I mean, the, the courses that I've been helping with, they're, they're at the college level. So they're not uh, within a discipline. They're not housed within a department. And so um, they're interdisciplinary. Um, and so some, maybe this is unethical, <laughs> but you kind of sneak in um, anthropological ways of doing things and think, you know, for, for example, in our class this semester, we're, you know, we're having students take notes um, in a, like a real notebook, you know, like you will, and write a letter as well, um, which is something, you know, students are used to writing text. They're not really used to like sitting and thinking, you know, very carefully. So some of those things are helping them, you know, sort of learn how to reflect. And I don't think that's necessarily specifically anthropological. Um, the other thing I was gonna say too is I found it really powerful when I was teaching at a community college, how many students were just like, like blown away, you know, just fascinated um, that they had an opportunity to take this intro course. Um, they didn't know what anthropology was before. I remember having a student say, um, you gave me language or you gave me a way to kind of argue, you know, with my loved ones about why the, my cousin who came out, um, why that this is okay, you know, for example. That was, you know, just one example. Um, and so I, I think it happens maybe in smaller, more subtle ways in my experience. Um, and maybe that's not enough, but um, those are just my thoughts. Hi, I just wanna say thank you for a really great panel. Um, uh, I'm a grad student at Florida International University, and uh, I also teach an entry-level writing and rhetoric class. Um, so while I'm very, I'm very interested in kind of this anthropological, um, pedagogical approach to different learning styles, our student body is primarily, uh, well, it's over 60% Hispanic, and overwhelmingly uh, first generation in higher education, and also the vast majority of the students work. Um, the work and home life demands of most of our student body changes throughout the semester. Um, I had several ghosting students, for example, during Black Friday, because they're working one, two, or three jobs, and just disappear from class. So I'm wondering um, what strategies uh, you guys might have to support those students who may disappear for short periods of time throughout the semester, and then what specifically kind of like online solutions you might have to help and keep them engaged, even if they can't physically make it to campus, um, and to help them kind of like come up with strategies of their own to help them learn how to deal with these times where they may not be able to be in person in class. Thanks. Uh, for me, this is a really important shift that's happened in our college as well at Kansas State. Um, just a huge portion of our students are now working a lot and, and can't make it to class. So it's become a matter of course now that, that every class I teach has sort of an equal component online and always offers uh, ways to engage with the class if they can't be there. Uh, it's a tricky balance and I don't know, it's, it'd be worth like a whole, uh, you know, a whole session, or even like a, and a whole. There should be several books out about it by now because it's it's a really important problem. That I think you're right to bring up the issue. We do have to figure out strategies for helping those students. I think it's it's going to be all over higher ed. Like this is the future of higher ed, and and we need to think about that. Um, so the. It's really awkward, um, kind of like we're being recorded now. Um, but the cl the class I'm teaching this semester is we we have like a TV, like a film crew in there every week, and I don't know if you have that. Um, and so I've had students, you know, have had different health crises or family emergencies who weren't, you know, and it was a short one credit course. It was like a what we call a dynamically dated. It didn't start and end at the with the rest of the semester. 
Um, so there's a short amount of time, you know, and you could lose credit or lose points really easily um, if you've just missed, you know, one or two classes um, for participation and whatnot. So it, that was really useful because I could say just go on to the online course management system, watch the course, send me like a paragraph, like, you know, as part of your participation grade, you know, to give them the option. I don't know if this is helpful, but in my academic advising role, you know, students who are thinking about um, not going on to graduate school, but going out and working, um, I'll encourage them to use that work experience um, as a resume builder and to think about what they're learning. You know, and again, this may not be super helpful kind of to what you're asking, but I don't know if there, are, there could be some creative ways to kind of incorporate their work experience into you know how the you know how you want to grade them or what they want to write or reflect on. Um, a couple of things. I agree with what's been said. I think this this is the future. Um, it behooves the teachers to be organized and have the thing laid out right. Like if it's going to be a process or a project, like have that ready to go. And like you said, test you know test it yourself. And um, I also believe in the, the flipped classroom and a lot can be, can be done, you know, sort of. But I think also teaching that kind of very intense time project management um, sort of skills, those are important. And sort of also uh, scoping things out. This wasn't really a big part of, again, maybe of anthropology education before, but like if you know you're gonna have a finite amount of time What's realistic to think you can get done and what's realistic to promise? Someone is counting on you to deliver what you said you were gonna deliver and I think you might as well learn that while you're in school, right? You know, um, I think where, where this is an issue is it requires, I don't know if you'd call it a different way of working on our end, but um, I think we have to be attentive to those things. Again, I think that's a part of the modeling of, of this way of learning and, and making sure that knowing the demographics of the field that most people are gonna come out and be practicing anthropologists, they really need to be on top of that because that's gonna be expected of them um, in jobs and to be successful and to get paid and, and really to do the kinds of work they may be wanting me to do. So I think a real goal is to help people learn to become successful in those ways. That would be maybe as important as any other goal in the class, I don't know. And I'll just wrap up. I agree with all my colleagues here. And then just one last thing is you design assignments. If you break them into smaller chunks, that will help a student manage. And even friendly reminders, you know, make sure you have this done by this time. That can give them a little bit of, of headway and mean one-on-one and planning. I even tell people sometimes, think about your bus rides. You can read at that time. So kind of where can you work in those little chunks to kind of schedule your day? I think we are at time. I encourage any further questions. We'll just kind of head towards the back. Uh, but thank you all for attending today.